Hi, so I'm Joshua Blumenstock, Assistant Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And today I'm going to talk about this area of research that I'm involved in, um, which I call Data Intensive International Development, but uh, for the purposes of this talk I'll say Fighting Poverty with Data. And so the work I do and that my lab does, and this is really an emerging field right now, is thinking about how you can use new sources of data new methods to better understand the causes and consequences of poverty. A lot of this work is based in developing and conflict-affected countries, but you can also do this work in the United States and in pretty much anywhere where there's poverty and, and unhappiness. Um, on the screen in front of you, you see several of the focal areas that my group works on, including measuring poverty, crisis and disaster response, internal and international displacement, refugee crises, and so forth. Um, but for the purposes of today, just to give you a little bit of taste of what this work looks like, I'm going to focus on this one area and do a bit of a deep dive into um, different methods for predicting poverty using big data and, and fancy algorithms. The context for this project, and I think a context for the lot of the projects that you're hearing about in this class, is you know, this new era, this new revolution in big data. And as students at the University of California, you're probably surrounded by this, and most of you are probably monitoring your mobile phones as you're listening to this lecture. And so with a smartphone in your pocket, you have access to Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp and social media. And this is, I think, what most people immediately think of when they think of the big data revolution. But it's also important to keep in context the, the big data that has existed around us for, um, for decades. And this is centralized, uh, structured big data with lots of big money behind it through, from the US government, um, from firms, and from other sources. Um, just to give you a few examples, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is collecting quarterly earnings reports, and, and the IRS is collecting annual data, and the Census Bureau spends tens of billions of dollars every decade um, collecting data from every single person in the United States, more or less. Um, but what I want to convey, and what I hope you can take away from this, is that this big data revolution um, is a little bit lopsided. And in particular, in some of the world's poorer countries, um, there isn't really the same issue of big, ubiquitous data. Um, what you can see on this slide in front of you is just how severe the the small data problem is in several developing countries. And you can see in Madagascar, for instance, it's been 21 years since they last did a fully, full national census. Um, in Afghanistan, where some of the work I'll talk about today is being done, it's been 35 years since they had a full census. And you might ask yourself, well, does it really matter that it's been more than 10 years since the last census? And, and the answer is yes. And, and this is one uh, example that will give you a little bit of a sense for how much changes in a country uh, when it's been 44 years between a successive censuses. Angola, the last time they did a census was in 2014. And in 2014, they measured the population to be about 25 million. Prior to that, the most recent census had been in 1970. And in 1970, the population was 5.6 million. And you can do the math, but the population growth between those successive censuses is something like 350%. And not to mention there was a very devastating civil war, there was mass internal migration. The structure of the population changed dramatically. And so for a second, put yourselves in the shoes of a policymaker or an aid worker who's trying to figure out where to allocate resources, where to build roads, where to put schools, where to send health workers. If the information you have is based on an understanding of an Angola population of 5.6 million instead of 24.4 million, you're going to be sort of screwed. And so the, the motivation for this is to say, is there any way we can take all these fancy algorithms that are coming out of the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world and apply them to solve some of these very pressing issues that are facing people who are trying to make conditions of living better in developing countries uh, where the data is very scarce. The research question we're working on here is about whether big data and machine learning and make it easier to measure poverty and vulnerability. And in a sense, this is really the most basic question you might ask about just measuring quality of life, measuring the state of affairs in, in poor and developing countries. The sort of data we're gonna to bring to bear on this question is, is the data that you see in front of you. In particular, 
On the left, you see this animation that's showing you mobile phone data from a single country. So this is a map of Afghanistan, and we've worked with the Afghan telecommunications operator to access and analyze their data. And what you're seeing in front of you is an animation of one day's mobile phone activity in the country. And you can see the, the connections, the geographic connections between Kabul and Herat and Kandahar and, and Mazar Sharif and these connections that are visible in the phone data very much reflect the economic and social connections that we know exist in the country. On the right is similar data, but this data is coming from Beijing. And if any of you have been to Beijing, you'll sort of see the ebbing and flowing structure of the ring roads that surround uh, the, the, the center of the city. And so the question we're going to ask is whether we can take all of this big data and use it to answer this very basic question about just measuring poverty and vulnerability in countries like Afghanistan and what I'm really going to talk about today is Rwanda. If you were paying attention, you remember that one of the first things I said is that big data is in some sense is a first world problem and that in fact the, the traditional big data sets that computer scientists and uh, a lot of researchers in the U.S. tend to think about like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and so forth. People aren't using these in developing countries. Um, the data that does exist and that researchers, computational social scientists tend to gravitate towards if they're interested in developing country problems, um, there's these two big exceptions where there's lots of mobile phones and there's lots of satellite data. And what I'll talk about today is what we can do with terabytes of mobile phone data, but there's very similar research that's come out in the last few years that shows you can actually do very similar sorts of analysis using terabytes or even petabytes of data coming from uh, overhead imagery from satellites. So specifically what we're going to do that's going to allow us to answer this question about measuring and estimating poverty, we're going to connect the digital trace data. So the data that's being generated when people are using their mobile phones, this is just the transaction logs that get generated, sort of the digital exhaust that comes through mobile phone use, with data that we're going to painstakingly collect through surveying people. So we're actually going to either go to the field in Rwanda, or in the case of the study I'll talk about now, actually just make phone calls to people who are using their phones. And so on the one hand, we'll have some rich quantitative perspective on exactly how they're using their mobile phones. And on the other hand, we'll have information that they're actually telling us in the survey about what their quality of life is. And we're going to take these two data sets and merge them together and use that combined with some machine learning to say something about what the signals of poverty and wealth are that exist in the mobile phone data. So this begs the question, how do we actually do it? How do we detect signals of poverty in how people use their phones? And intuitively, you might suspect that this would be a fruitful exercise if you just ask yourselves, do I think that rich people use their phones differently than poor people? And forget about Rwanda and Afghanistan. Just think about students in the class that you're, that, that you're sitting in. You might think, yes, maybe wealthy students have certain types of phone plans. Maybe they own certain types of phones that cost more. Um, or maybe more subtly, they make certain types of calls. Like maybe wealthy students tend to call a certain so section of their social network. Or they tend to make more international calls. Um, and these are exactly the sort of intuitive insights that we want to use to, to solve this research question. Specifically, what we're going to do is divide this question methodologically into two steps. The first step is what computer scientists tend to refer to as feature engineering or feature generation. And the first step is to take you know, the raw data on mobile phone use, which I'll talk about in a second, but convert that into features, in other words, just quantitative metrics that describe how people use their phones. So in general, feature engineering is this, it's to convert the raw data into a set of features or quantitative metrics that can be input into a model. In our case, as I said, we want to, the, the features that we care about are metrics, ideally interpretable metrics, of how people use their phones, like number of calls per day or number of international contacts that the person speaks with. The second step is once we have all those features, and in theory there could be thousands of such metrics that describe how someone uses a phone, we want to have a principled set of methods for A, determining which features are predictive of the thing we care about, and B, 
using those features to actually predict the thing that we care about. And that all sounds a little bit vague, but I'll get more specific in a second. So in general, what supervised machine learning does, and that's gonna be the tool that we're gonna to use to solve this problem, is it allows you to take a training data set, in other words, a set of data with known labels, known inputs and known outputs, and learn a function that maps inputs to outputs. And I'll give you an example of this in a second, but in our case, the specific inputs that we have are the phone data, and even more specifically, the phone features that we've gotten from feature engineering and map those to a set of outputs where the outputs that we care about in this case are things that we measure in the phone survey and in particular wealth. So in a phone survey, we can ask someone about how wealthy they are and that gives us a sense of ground truth and we want to say, okay, given that sense of ground truth of wealth, can we use the phone data like number of contacts and number of international calls to estimate that ground truth. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about each of these two steps in a little bit more detail. So feature engineering with phone data. So again, the goal here is to convert the raw phone data into a set of meaningful or interpretable metrics that describe phone use. And so what you're looking at in front of you is actually one row of several billion that exist in the transaction logs that we get from the mobile phone company. So, you know, the mobile phone company, anytime there's something that happens in the country, they log that event. If there's a phone call, they log it. If there's a text message, they log it, and so on and so forth. They need that data in order to bill the customers and keep track of their books. So we take that data and we, you know, there's a lot of it. It sort of looks like, you know, the matrix, but all it has is these six or seven key fields. So we have, for every phone call, we know the identity of the person making the call, the identity of the person receiving the call, we know the date and time at which the event occurred, we know the duration and a little bit of other metadata about the call, and then importantly we also know approximately the physical location of the party during the phone call. Because all of those events that are mediated by the cell phone network are routed through actual physical cell phone towers. And we know the location of cell phone towers and that allows us to roughly place people in time and space at the time event occurs. So buried in these transaction logs is these interpretable, meaningful features, things like the number of calls per day. So if you had a database that had billions of rows that described all the phone calls happening in the country, you could imagine writing a database query that would pull out for each person the total number of calls per day. And likewise, there's literally thousands or hundreds of thousands of other metrics that you could come up with, like the average duration of calls made on a weekend. Or if you wanted to capture something about the physical mobility of the person using the phone data, you could just look at the number of unique cell phone towers that they visit, that in, from which they make calls or receive calls, and so on and so forth. And you know, an interesting thought experiment is to brainstorm you know, what you think would be the single best feature that you could derive from a mobile phone data set that would predict poverty or predict wealth. You know, before we actually did the analysis, we sat around the table and thought about this a little bit ourselves. And the sort of things that we thought intuitively would be predictors of wealth would be um, total amount of money spent talking on the phone. Or another one that's more specific to the context of Rwanda is to look at the ratio of outgoing calls to incoming calls. So my, why might that be predictive in Rwanda? Well, the structure of the billing system in Rwanda is that it's only caller pays for the phone call. And it's all prepaid accounts, so you don't get billed at the end of the month. You get billed, you load a balance onto your phone, and then every phone call you make, it gets deducted. In other words, if I want to talk to my friend Joe, if I call him, it costs me money, but it doesn't cost him anything. If he calls me, vice versa. And so what you tend to see is this social norm that has evolved in Rwanda, where generally a wealthier person is the one who initiates contact with a poorer person, or if it happens that the poorer person wants to talk to the wealthier person, they do this thing called either beeping or flashing or sending a missed call where person B will call person A and hang up. And that's a signal that person A should call person B back. And that way person A bears the cost of the call instead of person B. And so all of this sort of qualitative knowledge led us to think that maybe the ratio of outgoing calls to incoming calls would be correlated with the wealth of the, the mobile phone user. So that's the first step. We need some sort of algorithm or some sort of quantitative method to derive all of these metrics from the phone data. And for the real nitty gritty details, you're gonna to have to do the readings and read the paper, but 
The core idea is that we take this insight from automata theory in computer science called a deterministic finite automata, which is basically a structured way of recursively generating these features. And the moral of the story is that this algorithm generates tens of thousands of metrics of phone use more or less automatically. So we didn't have to sit around the table brainstorming for days and days coming up with each of these thousands of features ourselves. We just had to program this finite state machine that would derive these metrics for us. But at the end of this first step, this feature engineering step, we're left with tens of thousands of these metrics that describe phone use. Okay, so then the question is, how do we figure out which of those tens of thousands of metrics is predictive of wealth? In other words, how do we figure out whether I was right that the ratio of outgoing to incoming phone calls is correlated with wealth? And this is where machine learning comes in. And machine learning is a very, very powerful paradigm that I think is coming up a lot in this class. Um, but the idea is that you want to have an algorithm learn the relationship between your input variables, which in this case is the phone data, and the output variables, which in this case is the measure of wealth that we el elicit in the phone survey. So for this particular study in Rwanda, we ran a phone survey with 856 people. And for these 856 people, because we spoke to them on the phone for roughly half an hour, we know both the inputs and the outputs, both the X's and the Y's. So the X's, the inputs, we're getting from the phone company. So for each person that we speak to on the phone, we get their phone number and match that to the database that we're getting from the phone company so we can extract all of those thousands of metrics that describe that person's phone use. And on the other hand, we have their survey responses. In other words, their whys that we want to predict. Because when we talk to them on the phone, we can get a sense for how wealthy they are relative to other Rwandans. And then what supervised machine learning is going to do is allow us to connect the X's and the Y's in a principled way. Okay, so that begs the question, how do we actually learn the relationship between our inputs and our outputs? And this is, again, where machine learning comes into play. And so what do I mean by machine learning? I'll, I'll just give you like a very intuitive picture of it. Um, and this comes from a guy named Pedro Domingos, who's really a, a giant in the field of machine learning. So traditional programming you can think of as the following, where you have data, and you write a program, and you feed the tooth of those into a computer, and on, on the other side you get output, right? So if it's a video game, the program might be the rules of the video game, and the data might be the inputs that you're giving through the mouse and the keyboard, and the output might be what you see on the screen and so on and so forth. This is the traditional paradigm of programming that you learn in computer science and most of web development and so forth. On the other hand, machine learning flips this on its head a little bit. So with machine learning, what you do is you feed the data into the computer and the output into the computer, and the job of the computer is to write the program for you. And so that all sounds a little bit abstract, but let me take the same diagram and then make it very specific to our context. So, with machine learning, again, we feed in the data and the output, and the computer comes up with the program. So our task right now is to use machine learning to predict poverty, to figure out the mapping between the X's and the Y's. So in, in the terms of this diagram, the data we're feeding in is the features, these X variables that we've derived from the call data. And the output that we feed in is the Y variables, the, the response variables, the things we want to predict. And what the computer comes up with is a program which is really just a model, a functional mapping that links those X's to the Y's. And when we have the model, it allows us to do the two key things we wanted to do from the very beginning. On the first hand, figure out which of those X's actually matter, which of those X's are correlated with the Y's, and on the other hand, allow us to predict the Y's given the X's. So for someone, once we have a model and we have their phone use, we can then use that to generate a prediction about how wealthy they are based on the model. And the key point is that the model is learned from the data that it sees. In this case, the data is the data coming from the 856 people that we called and that we have their phone data of. So what does it actually look like? Once we've gone through this process, fed in the input data, the output data, and have the program on the other side, what does the model tell us are the most important features? And short answer is I was wrong. I mean, I wasn't totally wrong that ratio that I spoke of earlier, the ratio of outgoing calls to incoming calls, is actually correlated with wealth. It's just not the most correlated feature out there. There's a lot of core features that the machine comes up with that we never would have thought about. Just to give you an example, 
The single feature that's most correlated with wealth in this sample is the following. It's a little bit convoluted and it might not make a ton of sense, but just bear with me, I'll tell you what it is. It's the weighted average of all first degree neighbors, day of week entropy of outgoing SMS volume. In other words, we look at the outgoing SMS volume, the number of SMSs per day made by each person in this very large network of phone users. And so then you have a distribution with seven buckets, one for each of the seven days of week, and you look at the entropy of that distribution, which is just a measure of the variance or noise of the distribution, the unpredictability of that distribution. And then you say, if I want to predict how wealthy John is, I look at the day of week SMS entropy of all of John's friends, all of the people that we observe John speaking to in Rwanda, and we take the average of their entropies. And for some reason that I don't pretend to understand, that feature is very predictive of wealth in Rwanda. So that gives you a little bit of an intuition for how this machine is working. What this feature that it comes up with is, unless you're really, really, really smart and insightful about culture in Rwanda, I'm guessing you probably never would have predicted is the single most predictive feature of, phone, of wealth in Rwanda. The machine learning algorithm combined with the feature engineering step allows us to pull those insights out of the data automatically. So that's the first piece. The second piece, and what we really care about, is that the function that we get from the machine learning part allows us to take all the features and use them to predict wealth. In other words, once we know for each person in the data set their outgoing SMS day of week entropy and their ratio of outgoing calls to incoming calls and all of these other 10,000 features that we derive automatically from the phone data, we can then pass those features through the model and come up with a prediction of how wealthy that person is. And what the scatter plot in front of you shows you is that the predictions are actually not too bad. So the way to think about the scatter plot is there's 856 dots. Each of those dots represents one of the people that we talked to on the phone, that participated in the phone survey, and for whom we have the phone data. On the x-axis, I'm showing you what the algorithm predicts the wealth of that person to be. In other words, based on the model that we learn from supervised machine learning, and based on the features that we get from the phone data, the output is the predicted wealth for each of those 856 people. And the y-axis shows you the actual wealth of each of those 856 people. And so what you see is this nice correlation between the predictions of the algorithm and the actual wealth as reported by the person in the survey. So this is nice. For the 856 people, we see this positive correlation between what the algorithm predicts their wealth to be and what their actual wealth is. And then where it gets really interesting is we can say, okay, let's take this model that was fit on a sample of 856 people where we know how wealthy they are, and let's apply it to a whole bunch of mobile phone users that exist in this database that we get from the phone company. And we won't know if the algorithm is right, but we can at least see what the predictions look like. And so when we do this in practice, we get these very beautiful images that tell us more or less the predicted distribution of wealth in Rwanda. So in Rwanda, at the time this study was done, there were 1.5 million phone users. What this map is showing you right now is the approximate location, as inferred from the locations from which they make and receive phone calls, of each of 1.5 million individual mobile phone users in the country. And what we can do is we can then fill in each of those cells with a prediction about the wealth of the person. And the prediction is coming from the phone data and the algorithm that I just explained to you. And once we have these maps of predicted wealth, we can generate very beautiful maps that show for an entire country what the estimated distribution of wealth looks like based on phone data. So this is Nigeria, it's a slightly larger country, which is why I'm showing it to you now, that shows the predicted distribution of wealth. So what you're looking at here is a map of the predicted wealth of Rwanda as inferred from phone data. And this map is created at the administrative cell level, which is sort of like a zip code in Rwandan terms. And what's interesting about this map is it's much more high resolution than any map that you can get from publicly available sources. The maps that you get from public sources look more like this. In particular, the map on the right is the map that was generated by the National Institute of Statistics of Rwanda, and it shows their estimated distribution of wealth at the district level. And notice that there's only 30 districts in their map, as opposed to the map I was showing you earlier that has about 2,100 cells.
So that's one advantage of this method. It allows you to get more fine-grained geographic estimates of the distribution of wealth than you could get with traditional data sources. And the nice thing here is we can actually validate our estimates by comparing what the National Institutes of Statistics of Rwanda says the distribution of wealth is, which they're spending millions of dollars on to collect household survey data on, and what our method, our algorithm says is the estimated distribution of wealth as imputed from the phone data, or the call detail records is the technical term for these phone data. And visually, you can see that the maps look fairly similar. Now, they're not identical. There's a few very salient differences. But when you quantitatively compare these two maps, the correlation is actually quite high. Um, it's 0.92, as you can see. So that's, that's really it for the research. That, that's what we've done. That's how we've taken phone data and used it to predict poverty. So at this point, you might be asking yourself a little bit, well, who cares? Is this actually useful? Um, I think we can agree, hopefully, that it's an interesting intellectual exercise, but, but is it more than that? And, and I'll try and make the argument that, that it is for a few reasons. So one I already made, which is that through these methods, you can get more fine-grained geographic estimates of the distribution of wealth and poverty than you can with traditional sources. But I'll give you a couple other examples, too. Another, and this really goes back to the way that I motivated this in the very beginning, is that it allows you to do what I'm sort of calling band-aid statistics. In other words, interim estimates of the distribution of wealth and poverty between official survey rounds. And so by no means am I implying that the maps we're getting, the estimates we're getting from phone data are better or a substitute for traditional methods of data collection, survey-based data collection. That sort of data is much, much richer and in general more reliable for a lot of reasons. But in the absence of such data, and this table should show you that in a lot of countries there is a severe absence of such data, these statistics that we're generating from mobile phone data can be a good substitute, at least in the short term. And they're much, much cheaper to collect and much faster to collect. A nationally representative household survey in Rwanda, which is a very small country, costs on the order of $10 million and takes several years to collect. The survey that I showed you a second ago cost $15,000, $20,000 to conduct and took about two months. And so these are just different orders of magnitude of complexity and cost for generating maps of the distribution of wealth and poverty. Another really exciting area where I think these methods can be applied is for real-time monitoring and for not just estimating a static map of the distribution of wealth and poverty, but for actually estimating dynamic changes in quality of life um, for households and villages over time. And if you can do that well, there's all sorts of really exciting applications. For instance, you can think about better targeting aid and assistance, humanitarian relief. For instance, this nonprofit organization out there called Give Directly, they make it possible to directly transfer money to villages in developing countries. And one of the problems they face is on figuring out which households within the village or which villages in general should be eligible for this aid. Because you, if you want to make it the biggest impact, you want to give it to the people with the greatest need. But understanding who has the greatest need is very difficult using traditional survey-based methods. Another application of these methods that I think holds a lot of promise is for impact evaluation. So when you want to figure out what policies to implement, Typically, you want to look at what policies have succeeded in the past or what policies have succeeded in other countries. And one of the key difficulties in conducting rigorous impact evaluation is a lack of reliable data about quality of life before and after policies are implemented. You can imagine using data and methods like we discussed today to provide better inputs to impact evaluation. In other words, you can get a better sense of what quality of life looked like before and after the policy was implemented using methods like the ones we talked about. A third application that I think holds a lot of promise is disaster response. And so what I'm going to show you in a second is another animation of mobile phone data in Rwanda. But instead of the previous versions where I was showing you what thousands of features look like for an individual person, what I'm going to show you now is the entire country's pattern of mobile phone traffic on this very specific day, which is the day of the Lake Kivu earthquake. So the Lake Kivu earthquake was a magnitude 6 earthquake that struck the country in 2008 in the Lake Kivu region of Rwanda, which you can see on this map. 
So what this video is showing you is call traffic every minute of the day of the earthquake in Rwanda. So each frame in this video is one minute and the country is divided into roughly 300 polygons where each polygon corresponds to one cell phone tower. And a polygon looks red if there's a relatively high volume of calls going into that tower at that particular minute. And what you'll see in the beginning of the video is a lot of noise, a lot of red and blue flashing, and there's not a lot that you can tell. But when the earthquake strikes at 9.30 in the morning, you'll see traffic in the, in the country dramatically changes, and all of a sudden, all of the traffic is flowing into the cells near the epicenter of the earthquake. And why am I showing you this? Because this provides some indication that the phone data itself can tell us when the, and where the earthquake struck. And you can imagine developing methods, and no one's done this yet, this could be work that you guys will do in the future, is using these data to figure out who is affected by social and economic and geopolitical events. What this figure is showing you is a slightly different view on the exact same data from the same day of the earthquake. And you can see these spikes that occur around 9.30 in the morning. That is the increase in call volume right after the earthquake. And if you look very closely, you can see that there's four different lines, and each of the four different lines corresponds to a different type of call behavior. The first line, this purple line, the immediate spike that happens right after the earthquake, that's people who are in the earthquake region calling people in the earthquake region. So that's within region calls around the epicenter. And then very shortly thereafter, there's this red spike, which is calls from people in the earthquake center outside calling people that they know that aren't located or affected by the earthquake, but we don't know why, but we see this data, maybe they're calling to tell them that they're okay. It's, your guess is as good as mine. And then a little bit later, there's this turquoise spike, which is people calling from outside to inside. These are the people that are calling their loved ones who are in the region affected by the epicenter. And there's this, you see there's a little spike in this turquoise line a little bit later. To be honest, I'm not sure why there's that spike, I assume it's because maybe that's when the news cycle broke in the capital or in the other regions that this earthquake had occurred. You know, these are some of the mysteries that remain to be explored in the data. And then finally, the, just for completeness, you see this green line in the background, which is just the normal, it's very much unaffected by the earthquake. That's people outside the earthquake region talking to each other. And that's sort of the background noise of call traffic. And so, again, why am I belaboring this point? It's just to show you that there's all this signal in the data that you could think of using to figure out who really is affected by um, severe crises. Okay, so I've given you a little bit of a taste of this research area in computational social science that I call data intensive development or more sexily fighting poverty with data about using new sources of data and new methods to better understand the causes and consequences of poverty. In, our, in the case of the predicting poverty example that I gave you, the new data was phone data, and the new methods were supervised machine learning and feature engineering, and we showed how you can take those and combine them to get very fine-grained maps of the distribution of wealth and poverty. I talked very briefly about how you could imagine using this for crisis response, and then there's all these other areas, and the six areas you see here are just a few of the ones that you might think of. But the point is the following. These new sources of data and these new algorithms are creating all sorts of high impact opportunities at the intersection of data science and, and development in uh, sort of this one particular area of computational social science. And there's a lot of open challenges. All of this research is just coming out in the last few years. And so for the smart or motivated student, there's a lot of opportunities to, to really do impactful work. I'll wrap up by putting this quote in front of you from the New York Times. Uh, by an economist named Sendhil Malanathan, who I think really articulates the, the point very well. And he says, why should the financial services industry, where mere dollars are at stake, be using more advanced technologies than the aid industry, where human life is at stake? And you could substitute internet and dot-com industry financial service, for the financial services industry, and the same point remains. A lot of the work being done here is taking off-the-shelf technologies that were designed to better optimize ad targeting to tweens and millennials and spinning those methods on their head and using it to try and derive insights that will improve quality of life in resource-constrained environments. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope you found this interesting. Uh, you can find links to this work and a lot of work done by colleagues on my website, which of course you can find by Mining My Digital Traces.